Good morning. Uh, it's so good to be here with you guys this morning. Uh, excited morning, second anniversary. I actually didn't know it was your second anniversary today until this morning, so that's exciting. And, uh, and then also a day where you're adding an elder uh, to your church. Um, if you look at the New Testament pattern, churches were established, and then there were a plurality of elders established, and, and uh, I'm really thankful for this day in your church. Uh, as we think about the church, um, it is Christ's church. Sometimes we forget that. He is the head of the church. It is not just, uh, uh, he's not just a figurehead, right? Um, when sometimes we say he's the head of the church, it's almost like, you know, that uh, President Emeritus or whatever. It's just like a figurehead, but they really don't do anything. No, he is the one who's in charge of his church, and he's, he's over it. And, and uh, what he wants for his church are for go- sorry, godly men to lead his church, and uh, they must have Christ-like character. Uh, they are to shepherd, they are to lead, they are to guide his people. And, and the church is strong as long as they look to Christ and they follow his word. And the, we're about, our church is about to get into the book of Revelation, and if you look at those seven churches, there is a threat for some of them to say, hey, I'm about to leave your church. Uh, I'm not going to be in your church anymore. And wh- why is that? Because they have no longer is Christ the center and no longer is the word central in the church. And so uh, what Jesus does is he takes his people and they go to a new church. That's what happens. And you look at some of our denominations across our country and uh, once great lights for the Lord and, and sadly uh, no more because they've neglected his word and are no longer following him. But I'm praying for this church that God will establish godly leaders who will keep their eyes on Christ, that the, that the word of God will be central in all they do. Uh, Christ is the rock. Uh, he's there in our times of trouble, and he's there in our times of praise. Uh, he is unchanging. He's all wise. He's provided everything that we need to get through whatever comes our way. Uh, godly leaders will not trust in their own wisdom to lead the church, but they will continually be men of prayer uh, and men who seek God through his word. Uh, they will not lead through their own strength, but they will lead through the power of the Holy Spirit. And when the leadership leads in a Christ-like way, then what the congregation is to do is then to follow that leadership. Uh, there's a lot of, I've done four weddings in the last four weeks up to this time, and, and so a lot of, a lot of marriage talk. And, and and there's that Ephesians 5 where um, the husband is to lead the wife as Christ leads the church. Uh, and, 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 and we're going to be talking about Christ leading the church. And then it, what's the reciprocal? Uh, submit, right? The wives submit to their husbands. Super popular uh, submission these days. Uh, but, 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 but what we're going to see is that it's a beautiful thing that God has created if we follow his ways. Not some worldly twisting of submission and leadership, but God's way. And so you might be thinking, okay, well, if this is just kind of about the elders this morning, it's kind of about the design of the church, I guess I just kind of check out, well, no, okay? Uh, this is for you to, to know and then to hold this church accountable too, right? Um, uh, if, if leaders are not doing what they ought to, then those leaders need to be removed. That's what we find in Scripture as well. So stay tuned in, okay? Uh, we're going to look at what's this, what does this look like on a day-to-day basis, godly leaders leading the church and then a congregation following. We're going to see that in First Peter 5 this morning, but before we do, let me pray for us and then we'll get into it. Lord God, we're so thankful for this time together this morning. Uh, God, we thank you that you are the head of your church. Uh, Lord, you began to build your church the day that you uh, resurrected, and Lord, you are uh, continuing to build your church, and uh, you will do so until you return. And uh, God, we're reminded that you are coming soon. Uh, Lord, help us to be ready. Help us to be uh, prepared for that. And as such, Lord, help this church to be the church that you would be honored and glorified in. Help it to be the church that's doing the work uh, that you've called them to uh, right up until the time you return. Uh, Lord, may this church be faithful. Uh, Lord, I thank you for Kyle and his leadership. I thank you for Tim and, and bringing him on as an elder on this day. And, and God, we pray, Lord, would you continue to add to the number uh, of leaders here. And, and God, may you purify this place. May you make this 
uh, a place that you are honored and glorified, and then a place where it's sent out, uh, Lord, uh, to, to be salt and light for your namesake. And so, God, uh, we're thankful for what you've done over those last few years, and we're excited about what you have in the days to come. And so, as we look to your word now, God, would you lead us? Would you help us? Uh, Lord, would you um, uh, help us to understand the things you have for us? And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so everyone, 1 Peter 5. 1 Peter 5, and uh, we're just going to look at the first uh, five verses this morning. 1 Peter 5, uh, verses 1 to 5. And so he says this, So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. All right, so... Focus on Christ. Don't, don't be caught up in distractions as a church. And as you focus on Christ, I want us to see, uh, first of all, that we need to see godly leaders following the pathway of Christ. And this is God's design for his church. And as you focus on Christ, you see godly leaders following the pathway of Christ. Uh, Peter has just finished. If you just look back to the verse pre previous, he's just told uh, what the, all the believers need to do in light of their suffering. He says in uh, verse 19, Therefore let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. A um, couple of things we want to know. Uh, suffering is expected. Uh, doing good is expected. And God wants us to trust in him. And then the next thing he says, So, okay, so, Anytime you see so, you want to look back. Okay, what, why, why is he saying that? Why is he saying so? He, he's saying, I want the elders to lead in this. And, and, and when it comes to suffering, you need to be ready to suffer as leaders. So he says, I exhort, exhort, sorry, exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder. He, he's, a, he's appealing to them as a, 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 an elder himself. He was also an apostle, but he was an elder He's not commanding them. He's coming alongside them. He's spurring them on to do that which is right. And, and, uh, and he's saying to them that, that they need to be ready to suffer based on verse 19. He's a fellow elder. In other words, he knows what it is to be an elder. Sometimes uh, it's nice to, you know, ha if, if you're having carpentry problems, you want a carpenter to help you, right? You want them, it means a lot more, right? Than someone else, right? So an elder speaking to elders, it, it would be bring comfort to them that he knows what he's talking about. And, and he says I, I, he also is not only an elder, but he's a witness of the sufferings of Christ. Um, think about what he got to see in those three years. Now, they didn't have a whole lot, right? Foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. They, and they kind of wandered from place to place. So there's times of need. Uh, over and over and over again, but he's seen how God had provided. Uh, he saw uh, Jesus' ministry continually being challenged by the Pharisees, them coming against him. He, he saw how even Jesus' earthly family didn't believe him, right? They're like, hey, yeah, I'm not sure what's wrong with him. He, he heard Jesus predict all the pain and suffering he was going to have, and then Peter himself tried to rebuke him, right? He, he, he's like, uh, no, that's never going to happen. And, and Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. He witnessed the plots against Jesus. He saw, saw Jesus in the garden, praying, sweating blood. He saw when Judas went up to Jesus and kissed him, betraying him with a kiss and then handing him over to the authorities. He himself had denied Christ three times on the night of his greatest need. And then he seen the beating, the whipping, the mocking, and then ultimately Christ dying on a cross where his greatest suffering took place, where he took my sin, your sin, upon himself on that cross and then suffered the wrath of God 
that was due you and I on himself. He took his, our eternal punishment upon himself on the cross. That was incredible suffering that he went through on behalf of you and I so that we might be reconciled to God, so that we might enter into the Holy of Holies. We just finished the book of Exodus. I mean, it's just, it's a great book, by the way. And, and, but through Christ, we now all can enter into the Holy of Holies. And it happens through suffering. It happens through suffering. Uh, we should not be surprised when we suffer. A anyone surprised when you suffer? Okay, so there's one guy still, two guys still watching, uh, listening. That's great. Okay. I, I'm, I'm still surprised when it happens. As if, some, as if it's something that should not be happening to me. That's, that's, if we're being honest, maybe, maybe you're unique people. That's great. Hamiltonians, are, they're strong people. Maybe the Calgarians are a little soft. Okay, that's fine. That's fair. But, but we think if we, if we do what we ought to do, if we follow Christ, you know, we do our devos and we, we pray and we go to church and, and, and then we'll be blessed. But, but what happens is that this life is full of suffering. And when it happens, it's, it's almost shocking to us. And, and, and yet the Bible over and over and over says you will have problems. Uh, John 15, Jesus speaking to his disciples, John 15 verse 18, he says, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it has hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love uh, you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Therefore, sorry, remember, therefore, that what I have said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. Now the world uh, does not like you. Uh, the world loves darkness. You are to be light. You are to be salt in this world. And, and you think, hey, they, they're going to want to hear the message. You remember when you first got saved and you started telling everybody about, about Jesus? Because you're like, uh, this is incredible. Uh, I just figured this out. I, 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 my eyes were open. But now everybody needs to hear this because this is great news. And everyone's like, just be quiet. Uh, we don't want to hear it. Right? And that happens often. That happens often. And if they rejected Christ, do not be surprised when they reject Christ you. But we continue to proclaim because we, it's what God calls us to. And so he says, but do not be surprised when you suffer. So getting back to what Peter is saying here, so I exhort the elders among you. Uh, leaders need to lead in walking through suffering. Uh, if they shrink back when the suffering comes, what will happen to the people that follow them? Well, they, too, will shrink back. So God is calling leaders, elders, to, to be bold in the midst of trials and persecutions and to embrace the fact that they will be hated and persecuted because of their stand for Christ. And maybe I can just remind us, too, as the world comes against us, the world is actually not our enemy. The people that you talk to, the people who maybe hate you because of what you just said to them. They're not your, really your enemy. Your enemy is Satan, who has blinded those who are coming against you. And so we continue to speak to these people with compassion, with love, even when they hate us. That's following the pathway of Christ, right? And so, um, and so we, we prepare for that, and, and, and Peter is saying, hey, uh, church, uh, by the way, uh, Peter's writing to a group of people who are under great persecution, great suffering, and so he's asking the leaders, lead in this. But then remember that this pathway that we're on, it, it isn't just full of suffering. Look what's at the end. He says, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Again, Peter had a unique seat. He'd seen all the suffering, but he'd also seen Christ in glory, right? On the Mount of Transfiguration, he'd seen him in his glory and, and talking with Moses and Elijah. I mean, that would have been a pretty cool moment, right? He actually got to see the resurrected Christ. That's incredible as well. But what he's talking about here is, is the glory that's to be revealed, not the glory that I've already seen. And he's saying that yeah, you're, you're going to be a partaker in this. That, that at the end of the suffering, there is glory, just as it was for Christ. 
And Christ has descended to the right hand of the Father. But, but for those of, you, uh, who are, uh, those of us who are still here today, though there are suffering, glory is still to come. Now, Romans 8, 18, For I consider that suffer the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Do you ever spend time thinking about the glory that is to come? Well, we ought to. Now, this life is not it. We're just sojourners. We're just tenting. Uh, maybe you like tenting. I'm not a big fan. So when I think about the tenting analogy, I'm like, I can't wait to not tent anymore. Okay? And, 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 and heaven is our home, and the glory is coming. But there's suffering between now and then. But glory to come. That's a great word for all of us. Whenever suffering comes, glory is coming. And the suffering, no matter, I mean, listen, the suffering that Paul is talking about, none of us here have experienced what, what, what our early brothers and sisters experienced. I mean, just this, this, this persecution, like unlike anything that we've ever seen, most of us here. Maybe you've lived in, in a place where that actually happens, but, but for most of us, we've never seen anything like it. And he's saying that suffering is nothing compared to the glory that will be revealed to us. And so, while we suffer, we keep one eye on heaven, remembering glory is to come. I remember um, our daughter, Hope, she had a, a brain injury about 13 years ago. And really dark times for our family. A time of maybe the greatest suffering for our family that we've ever experienced. But uh, Hope had said something a couple weeks earlier when, when Heather was stressed about something, she was like, you know, Mom, why are you so stressed? If, if Jesus comes back tomorrow, what does it matter? And, and it was just like, okay, that's, that's what we're clinging to as we go through this. We can go through anything for one more day if Christ is coming back tomorrow. And that's what we need to remember. That's what we need to strive for. Christ is coming soon, and then glory. Or if he tarries, we're still going to glory, Right? One out of one people die. So, at the end of this life, glory. Let us remember that as elders, though the time it can be hard and can be difficult, remember it's not in vain. Glory is coming. Secondly, a church focused on Christ sees godly leaders mimic the person of Christ. Mimic the person of Christ. We're going to see five different ways in these two verses in verses two and three. First, we see uh, personal, uh, personal. Maybe, maybe a better way to put it: personal care, personal care. They need to be known by the sheep. Uh, it says this: shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Uh, first, we need to note it's God's flock, right? It's not Kyle's flock. It's not Tim's flock. It is the flock of God. And what God does, he says, these are my sheep. I'm entrusting them to you. And this is true of all shepherds. They, they look to the master shepherd, Jesus Christ. But then it says this. Note that it says, uh, shepherd the flock of God that is among you. And I think this is, um, did you guys ever look at the internet? Uh, podcasts. all blogs, all this kind of stuff on the internet. And you're like, did you hear about this church in Atlanta? And they're doing this. And, and guess what happens to us up in Alberta? We're tempted to be like, oh, like we really should worry about this in Alberta. Why? Like, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, right? Like, it's not Kyle's job to, to shepherd the people in Atlanta. His job is to shepherd the flock of God right here in this room. And Tim, today, starting today, that's his job, okay? Among you. And, 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 and in that, the shepherds need to know the sheep. And so that means they're, they're going to get together with you. They're going to ask you, how's, how are things going? And if you just talk about your pets, that's, they're not going to really be able to care for you, okay? So, so I, I, my desire for this church is, I used to say this, and then it was like the whole COVID thing, but, but like take off your mask, okay? And do you know what I mean by that? I'm not talking about the COVID mask. I'm talking about the mask that we wear at church on Sunday morning, right? You, come, you know, you had a fight all the way here, right? You get into the parking lot, and you're like, come in, like, hi, everyone, how are you? Yeah, whoa, we're great. We're doing so good, right? And you just had a terrible week. Why are we doing that? You just say, hey, it was a rough week. Uh, okay. 
Well, now, now we can talk about it. Well, what does God's word say about the things you're going through? So let us be open with one another. Be open with your shepherds so they can care for you. Shepherd the flock that is among you. What does it mean to shepherd? Any, any uh, shepherds here? Okay, not, not too many shepherds in Alberta. Okay, so what do they do? Uh, Johnson says this, the work of the shepherd includes guiding and guarding, feeding and folding. And then the heiress tense here conveys a sense of urgency. It calls upon elders to be devoted to the task. And so feeding and folding, the way that we think about that in GCC world is doctrine and discipleship, right? They are to be over doctrine and they are to be over discipleship. And they are to make sure that the, the Bible is accurately taught and true to what God teaches. This is how the flock of God is fed. Uh, that's why I'm in Canada still, right? I, I was, uh, we went down to L.A. to school. I love warm weather. Uh, my wife and daughters have American citizenship. I'd love to someday, but I don't, okay? But they have it. And, and, and I was like, we're going to stay in the States. That'd be great. And then I come up here to home, to Alberta, and as God would have it, we go to churches, and the churches that we went to, guess what didn't get open? The Bible. The Bible didn't even get open. If there was, maybe a verse and then a TED Talk. And I was, I was fired up for all the wrong reasons. You know what I'm talking about? Okay? I'm like, feed the people. Like, just give them the food. Like, you, what are you doing? And, and, and just really stirred in my soul about it. And I was like, well, hopefully God sends somebody to do something about that because I'm going to be in the United States <laughs> where it's nice and warm. And, and then God started changing my heart and mind towards, hey, come back to Canada. And I, I, I didn't know if I was going to be able to preach God's word or not, but I did know this. I was going to open it and I was going to teach what was here. And, and, and that's what we need. That's what, that's what, that's what you need as the people of God, more than anything else. You need to know what God's word says for your life. Do you know this? All his ways are good. They, all of them. Like That's something we need to remember because we forget it. It's right back to Genesis 3 over and over and over again. We doubt God, but all his ways are good. And we need to know them that we might live the lives that God desires for us. And so we, as we, as we look at the word, we preach it, we teach it unapologetically. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. If you want to be able to do all that God wants you to do, you must know the Bible. And so this morning, I, 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 it is my prayer that you would cling to his word as a people. That as, as, as people come into this pulpit every Sunday, that they, it, they, all they have is the word. Often we say this at our church, I got nothing for you. But we believe God's word has something for us this morning, so let's look at that. That's, that's what we, we live for. And so as elders, they have nothing better for you than God's word. And, and, and so expect that from them. And as a people, let's be disciplined in our time. So many distractions. I mean, how many, how many times have we said, man, I just I haven't had time to read my Bible this week. Really? Uh, how many shows did you watch? Did you listen to some podcasts? Did you, like, how many, how many things do we get distracted with, right? So let's not make excuses. Let's instead cling to God's truth together. And as Elders come over you, they will bring the word. This is what you need. In a world full of a billion voices, we need one voice. That's God's voice in his word. Uh, secondly, elders are to mimic Christ through uh, being protective. They are to exercise oversight, it says. Exercise oversight. Uh, we have looked at the feeding and folding aspect of shepherding. Now we look at the guiding and guarding. Uh, they're to, to give direction, uh, dis discipline. To give spiritual oversight to care for the sheep. It is the constant duty of the elders and the continual need of the sheep. This is why people who shepherd literal sheep, they do it both day and night, right? They, they always need protecting. The need for protection and guidance is continually there. 
uh, Paul, as he's about to leave the, the church in Ephesus, he has this warning for them in Acts 20, verse 29. He says this, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among, them, among you, uh, among your own selves, will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. He, he warns, this is not a 2024 problem, he warns that when he leaves, there's going to be people who will come in to try to destroy the church. And everyone who comes in these doors are, are here for good reasons, right? Not everyone who comes into these doors are, are truly a part of the church. They attend the church, but they're not part of the church in the sense that they've never been redeemed. And, and Paul warns, there's going to be wolves. And he says, he says here in this verse, to exercise oversight. Uh, the, an overseer was someone who would watch over. You know, from the tower, you know, these walled cities, and, and they'd look out at the troubles coming to see what was coming and, and care for the city. This is what uh, uh, shepherds to do and elders to do. They're to protect the sheep against false teaching, not allowing people to, to come into the church that would harm it. God expects elders to follow his world, word and to lead accordingly setting direction for the church. If someone comes in here, you know, so if I got up here and I was like, you know, uh, Jesus uh, was, a, was a great man. He was a great prophet, but he wasn't God. What, what Kyle should do is just tackle me, right? Right there, okay? Take me out. I, I, I remember we were getting our training in, uh, in Arizona. It was in Prescott, Arizona, town of a redneck place. And, uh, and the elders were like, yeah, our job is to take care of the wolves, and we love shooting sheep, or shooting wolves, sorry, shooting sheep, <laughs> shoot. <laughs> right? And, 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 you know, is that, but, but, but you need to have that care for the sheep, that if someone here is dangerous, what it was called, was the church to do? Their first elders are to go and warn that person, say, hey, you need to repent. And if they're like, well, I'm not repenting, then two come and say, hey, you need to repent. And then they're like, well, no, I'm not going to then the whole church is saying, hey, you're not welcome here anymore. But we're praying for you, that you would repent, because we'd love to have you come back again. Well, why do you do that? Because that's what God's word tells us to do, so that the sheep would be protected. And so we must do these things as elders. So the elders are responsible for doctrine, for discipline, for direction, and discipleship. And then we see that they are to be proactive it says this, that they're to serve not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you. The elders were chosen and appointed by others based on the character they exhibited, as was described by the apostles. And in your study of First Timothy, you, you, there, you see that there's this, this, anyone who aspires to be an elder aspires to a good thing. And so they are to, to not serve begrudgingly. Uh, Wheaton says this, the elders should not occupy the office as a reluctant draftee, doing an irksome task because he feels he cannot escape it. Such a feeling might arise from a false sense of unworthiness, a reluctance for responsibility, or a desire to do more than was morally required in the office. Rather, elders are to, to, to guard their attitudes, they were, to remember the amazing grace of God that he would trust his sheep to their care. Love for God and love for his people should be what is continually motivating the elders to serve well. Remember that you're serving Christ as elders. When elders keep their focus on Jesus, they're reminded of how much Christ did on their behalf, and then they serve with thankfulness. It's important that elders do not lose that focus and serve the king willingly. Because it can be hard, right? I mean, 14 years at the same church, not every day is like, man, I'm, this is the best job ever. I'm so glad I'm doing it, right? But you look to Christ, you're like, it is a privilege that I get to do this job. And so God, help me to do it willingly. Uh, next, we see there to be philanthropic. Philanthropic, right? Uh, why am I using philanthropic? Because it's a P word, okay? Okay? And, and what does it mean to be philanthropic? It is to be benevolent or kind, benevolent or kind. 
It says there to, to, not, to serve not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly. The elders are to oversee the flock, not, not motivated by uh, greed, uh, motivated by financial gain or power in some way. And um, not so much of a problem in Canada, but it can happen as far as um, uh, certain denominations, right? Uh, we kind of, the, the health and wealth thing. Um, hey, God wants you to be blessed. How's that work? Well, give me your money and God will bless you, right? Maybe, maybe you've been sick on a Sunday morning, you flip on the TV, you might see a guy, a guy or two like that, right? Well, the Bible teaches that uh, the elder who teaches is worthy of double honor, right? So there, was, there is this idea that, that pastors get paid, but if they're greedy, if they're seeking personal gain through it, there's a whole lot of warnings in the scripture of what will happen to these kinds of shepherds. One example is found in Ezekiel 34, Ezekiel 34, 8 to 10. Uh, Jesus, uh, sorry, the Lord says this, As I live, declares the Lord God, surely because my sheep have become a prey and my sheep have become food for all the wild beasts, since there was no shepherd, and because my shepherds have not searched for my sheep, but the shepherds have fed themselves and have not fed my sheep, therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. What will happen to the guy who did not care for God's people? What's going to happen to the guy who did not feed his sheep? Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my sheep at their hand and put a stop to their feeding the sheep. No longer should the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths, that they may not be food for them. And God's going to rescue his people away from shepherds like that. And we praise the Lord that he is the head of the church and protects his people. But God calls us to serve not for not shame not not shame for shameful gain right but eagerly lastly a godly leader seeks to be pastoral it says this in verse 3 not domineering over those in your charge but being examples to the flock not domineering over those in your charge but being examples to the flock uh, hebert puts it like this the phrase to domineer indicates intensity and depicts a heavy-handed use of authority for personal exaltation that manifests, manifests itself in the desire to dominate, accompany, accompanied by a haughty demand for compliance. And unfortunately, I've seen these kinds of shepherds. Uh, for a while, they can get a lot done, right? They just kind of like, like keep just hammering away at the people. And, 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 they're, and, and they're threatened and they, and they are angry people. But God removes those kinds of shepherds as well. But instead, they are to, to be servant-hearted. Look at Jesus' example in Matthew 20, verses 25 to 27. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the elders of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise over authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom of, of many. Jesus, the Lord of everything, the Lord of all, he served others. And if Jesus served, how much more should his leaders serve his people? Elders are not to lead by threatening or manipulating and using their power like a weapon, but rather they are to lead by example. They will not ask anyone to do something that they themselves are not willing to do. When they preach and teach, they must also live what they're teaching. They are to be examples. Now, Grudem says this, all in leadership positions in the church should realize that the requirement to live a life worthy of imitation is not optional. It is part of the job, challenging through such responsibility, sorry, challenging though such responsibility may be. There is a calling if you are if you're preaching a certain message from the pulpit, then you are you ought to be striving to do the same thing yourself. If if not, then you should not be an elder. You should not be a pastor. Now, the Greek verb used here reminds us that it is a process as well. That they're they're growing in these things. Uh, Lord willing, you know, Kyle's two years in, 
Uh, Twelve years from now, he should be more of an example than he is today. There's this maturing that happens. There's this sanctifying that happens in the church, right? We're all growing, hopefully, to be more and more like Jesus. He who began the good work in you will be faithful to complete that work. And so even in this, there is a growing. So what should the leader look like? Athanasius said this, the life should command and the tongues persuade. So they are to mimic Christ. Personal care, protective, proactive, philanthropic, and pastoral. Lastly, for the elders, a church that focuses on Christ sees godly leaders receive the prize of Christ. When you've done all that God has called you to do, verse 4 says this, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Uh, Right back to what he was talking about in verse 1, this glory that is to come. Uh, Who is the chief shepherd? It is Jesus Christ. He is the one who is over his church. And when he appears, we will receive the unfading crown of glory. Tim and Kyle are accountable to Jesus Christ. And one day they will give an account to the Lord as to how they shepherd his people. Paul is encouraging the elders to be faithful during trying times. The role that God is calling them to sometimes is full of heartache and tears and struggle and a lot of hard work. Maybe tempted to quit at times. But it's necessary to keep their eyes on the future. Godly leaders' future isn't built on wishes but on facts. This is something that we we need to cling to even as the people of God. Christ is coming and his reward will be with him. This is not like, man, wouldn't that be a great ending to the story? Wouldn't that be something? No, this is what is going to happen. These are not hypotheticals. The, The crown of glory, the, the idea of a crown is something that was given on many different occasions during this time. People would receive crowns for winning victories in athletics or a reward to honor a citizen for public service. And it's most likely the crown of victory that he's saying here. When we persevere, we will receive the crown of victory. We receive crowns here on this earth. They're temporal. Note that the the crown here is eternal. It's an unfading crown of glory. Godly leaders are assured of this. And so they ought to continue to keep their eyes on him and strive accordingly. So now, what is the responsibility of the church? A a church that is focused on Christ, lastly, should see godly laity following the pattern of Christ. Laity, that is, anyone who's not an elder is called the laity. Godly laity is to follow the pattern of Christ. It says in verse 5, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. First, the, the, the laity are to be supportive. They're to be supportive. I phrase this in a proactive way. Note that he says likewise. Now, the word likewise is used to show that, that Peter is making a transition in this discussion. In the same way that the elders serve Christ through the things that he has commanded, so now likewise, you who are younger. And, and, and a lot of the scholars believe that this, there's phrased here for the younger because they are the least likely in the church to listen, right? Okay? They, 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 it's, it, you know, we like to rebel. And what I, lo- hey, by the way, this is a side thing. What I love, what, I see something crazy happening in our country. I see a lot of young people rebelling against the evil that's happening in our world, Right? They're, they're, they're looking at the, the, what's happening, and they're like, this doesn't seem right. And they're looking for answers. And so I can I just encourage you to continue to be salt and light for his namesake, because God is moving in unique ways right now. Just a quick story, okay? Will you bear with me? There's a gal. She had been a vice principal, and uh, because she wouldn't get with the, the rainbow theology, um, she got kicked out of the school, Okay? So she does a secular job, but she has a heart for kids. And, and, and so, so then she, she gets a, a role in a school, more of an administrative role. It's a work program. They, she's given a classroom for an office. It's a brand new school in Calgary. And, and one day, some kids came into her office. There was four kids that came into her office. 
and they seen a Bible in her room. And they're like, are you a Christian? And she said, yeah, I am. And she, they said, can we start a Christian club here? Well, guess what? Being a vice principal, <clears throat> excuse me, she knew how to start these clubs. And so she said, we sure can. You guys are requesting it. So uh, they started this club. And these kids said, well, we want, we want to use it to reach out to our friends. And so they started doing Christianity Explored. And then a youth pastor heard about what was going on. They started bringing pizza in. Well, this thing just kept growing. Well, the staff was like, well, they can't do this. And, and so they, they said, well, this, we got to shut this down. So they tried to shut it down. And so for a couple of weeks, they weren't meeting. And this gal, she's like, let's just pray. Let's just pray. And then the parents came around and said, well, what, do, what do you mean our kids can't have these clubs? If all these other kids can have the clubs, why can't our kids have a club? Nobody's being forced to go to this thing. And so guess what? The club kept going. By the end of the year, they had 71 kids at that club. Okay? That's why I'm telling you, God's doing something right now. Okay? Let us have faith to believe. That was for free. Okay? <laughs> Your copy time will be shorter as a result. Okay? So he's saying, likewise, you who are younger. So, so all of us, and what, really what he's saying, all of us in this room, and specifically he's saying to the younger what are they to do? They are to be subject to their elders. It's another way of, of saying be submissive. And, and again, as I've done all these weddings this last month, uh, submissive is not this like, well, we just do whatever they tell us to do. We just kind of turn our minds off. That's not what submission is. It is saying with wives, I submit to my husband as unto the Lord. You submit to the leadership of this church as unto the Lord. So as they follow Christ, as they follow his word, you follow them. They stop following Christ, they start following his word. Guess what? You don't listen to them anymore. That's how it works. And, and this is the way God has designed it. And I, I've found so many churches that have been around that, that, they, that, that, that the church thinks the, that their job is to critique the leadership, is to put down the leadership, to slander the leadership. And, and, and that's, that's not the case. They are to respect the leadership, and they are to follow them as they follow Christ. Second thing we see here, they are to be servant-hearted. It says, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. Like, like all of us together. I love the word, the word here, that clothe yourselves. Walls uh, says this, to clothe refers to a slave or a servant putting on an apron or towel to serve someone else. Peter, when did he see this? He's seen Jesus clothing himself with humility the night that he washed their feet, the night that he was betrayed, right? And he's got that imagery in his mind. He said, as Jesus did this for us, we're to do it for one another. We're to serve one another. Philippians 2, 3, and 4 says this, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. And, and so as you gather together, uh, you don't come to church for yourself. You come to church to worship the king, and you come to church to spur one another on, to care for one another. And then you go back into the world again. Now we, we, we benefit, right? We benefit, our own souls benefit when we do it, for sure. But we, we come to serve, serve one another and serve our king. So what does serving one another look like? How do you prioritize your time? Do you pray for one another? Do you take time to encourage one another by reaching out to one another during the week? Do you take time to encourage those whom the Lord lays on your hearts who may be anxious or lonely? What about your money? How do you use your money? Are you thinking about ways that you can save more so that you can see his kingdom expanded? Are you reaching out to your small group members? Are you reaching out to those who are not in a small group? When the elders direct you as a church and as individuals, is your first reaction to argue, to resist, or to submit? And then again, elders, let's Remember that you too are to serve with a heart of humility, to love the people as Christ loved you. This is God's design for his people. And by his grace, I pray that you would
be servant-hearted towards one another. And then what's at stake? Lastly, we see be spirit-led. It says, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Well, what happens to the church that doesn't follow God's ways? Well, he is opposed to that church, but he gives grace to the humble. Peter had experienced where his pride led him, right? Remember when Peter said, I, I would never fall away, Lord. Though all else would fall away, I won't fall away. I would die for you. And by the end of the night, he had denied Christ three times, right? In his pride, he fell. But then Jesus, in his mercy, in his grace, he restored him. We, we need to be a people who walk in humility towards one another, to, to live according to God's word. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. The proud look to their own strength and abilities. The humble look to God. You want to be the parent that God calls you to be? Pray. You want to be the husband or wife God wants you to be? Pray. You want to be the church that God calls you to be? Then pray, because you cannot do it in your own strength. So as this church takes on new eldership today, I am praying that you put your trust in him as a church family and that you would see his grace amongst you in incredible ways. Elders, follow the pathway of Christ, mimic the person of Christ, receive the prize of Christ. Church, be supportive, be servant-hearted, be spirit-led. Amen? Amen. Let me pray. Lord, we love you. We're so thankful for this church family. And God, I, I do pray for them. I, I pray that as they walk in humility before you, Lord, that you would build them up, that you would strengthen them in their faith. That, Lord, as they are sent out, that they would be bold for your namesake, that they would be salt and light wherever you would take them. And then as they return each week to gather together, Lord, that they would serve one another well. Lord, I do thank you for, for Kyle and for Tim in leading this church. God, I pray that you would give them much wisdom and grace, Lord, as they look to you. That, that, Lord, they would not serve out of their own strength. Lord, that they would not uh, serve out of their own wisdom. But, Lord, they would live according to your word and counsel accordingly. And, God, we, we pray, would you build this church up? That there's just so, uh, such a great need in this city for, for Christ-exalting, word-centered churches. Uh, we pray for, for influence in this city, Lord, not just for the, the folks here, but beyond, Lord, that there be other churches that would be encouraged to also be Christ-exalting, word-centered churches. Lord, we, we need you for that to happen, for the church to be in Canada what it ought to be. God, we, we can't do it in our own strength. And so, God, we look to you. Have your way, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to call uh, Tim and Kyle.